What makes a species a species? This might seem like an easy question, but I want you to really think about it. In the most simple way, you might define a species as a group of organisms with similar traits. But this is, well, rather very vague. What counts as a group? How many similar traits makes an organism its own thing? What even counts as similar? Think about all the different dog breeds. Many are so different from one another in terms of size, shape, color, and behavior, yet they're still considered one species, Canis familiaris. For these questions and more, many biologists have added to this definition, so that a species is a group of organisms with similar traits that can reproduce to create more of itself. But this only opens up a whole new can of worms, as many animals we'd think of as separate species would qualify as one under this definition. How can a male lion and a female tiger be considered separate species if they can breed with one another to create a liger? Or how can a male tiger and a female lion mate to produce a tiger? What about a male donkey and a female horse, which together can create a mule, or a coyote and a wolf to create koi wolves. If these animals are separate species, how can they reproduce with one another? Maybe our definition just needs to be tweaked a little further. Some go on to suggest that a species is a group of organisms with similar traits that can reproduce to make fertile offspring. But again, this basically gets us no closer. While it's true most of these hybrids are infertile and therefore cannot reproduce, ligers have been proven to be fertile on occasion, and in 2012, a Attendees to the Russian Novosibirsk Zoo witnessed the birth of a liger, a liger cub born from a liger mother and a lion father. Certain female mules have also shown to be fertile, and koi wolves have no problem reproducing. But if you really know your biology, you might say that nearly all of these hybrid offspring have been of delicate health to say the least, and not nearly as strong or reliable as offspring that are kept within species. Which is true, hybrid offspring have been notably difficult to keep alive into adulthood and most would be altogether unlikely to survive in the wild. But this doesn't mean there aren't plenty of examples of this in the real world. There's one hybrid species in particular that I don't think anyone can dispute is likely to survive and prosper, humans. Yes, that's right. Humans are the product of breeding between what we'd consider different species. 100,000 years ago, as Homo sapiens were just beginning to expand and diversify into races, we weren't alone in the Homo genus. Beside us Homo sapiens walked the likes of Homo neanderthalensis, or Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens denisova, what we'd call Denisovans. Salvaging DNA from fossils, we've found Neanderthal DNA containing fragments of the Homo sapien genome. Moreover, peering into our own genome, we've found large influxes of Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA from our past. Neanderthals were mainly found in Europe and Western Asia, and it's in those people groups today that most remaining Neanderthal DNA is to be found, with an average of 2% of our genetic makeup being from this relative species, while people of purely African descent will actually likely have zero Neanderthal DNA. Then, the people of Eastern Asia and the Pacific Islands had great amounts of contact with the Denisovans, and some people groups in the region can contain upwards of 5% Denisovan DNA. So, not only did the children of human, Neanderthal, and Denisovan hybrids survive, they thrive, despite currently being considered different species. So clearly, there's still something wrong with our definition. In reality, there are countless definitions and theories out there, each one trying to define the species concept, and each one comes with its own evidence to the contrary. This is known as the species problem. No matter how you define a species, there will always be examples that make us question whether or not it's true. What might fit for organisms that reproduce sexually could be utterly meaningless in trying to define and categorize things like bacteria which produce asexually. Trust me, I haven't even mentioned the insanely complex interspecies mating of plants, where basically every idea of a species we've talked about so far breaks down even further. Even requiring all members of a species to exhibit similar traits and behaviors is problematic. Think back to dog breeds, which can look so different but in terms of DNA are virtually identical. And then there are members inside a species that purposefully exhibit different traits based on a variety of factors like gender, age, social role, etc. At the end of the day, looking completely different doesn't mean something is not genetically the same. Being able to reproduce with something doesn't mean it's the same species either. And the inverse is also true, so organisms can look extremely
extremely similar, but B of a completely different makeup, like a raven and a crow, which you might have even thought were just two names for the same bird, but they're not. So how about this? We sequence the DNA of every single organism, then that's it. Whatever matches with that DNA is of that species. Well, it might feel redundant to say at this point, but even within every population of breeding individuals are differences which make up the gene pool. No two organisms are 100% genetically identical or 100% genetically unrelated. In short, there's no clear line, not in traits, not in reproduction, not even in DNA, that allows us to cleanly divide species. So why is this so hard? The idea seems simple enough and people all around the world recognize and categorize organisms the same way. Well, part of the issue might be the invention of the idea of a species in modern science has its origins, surprisingly, in the concept of creationism. You see, the thought was that if God created every animal and plant, he did so deliberately, and therefore each one should fit nicely into a category of its own because it was intended to be so. It was only with the expansion of our knowledge and understanding and the popularization and acceptance of the theory of evolution that problems began to arise. New species would simply form from old ones, and lines we thought were clear and defined grew vague and uncertain. But still, this idea that everything in nature is definitive because God made it that way has stuck around even into modern day, even if we've forgotten the God aspect of it all. In reality, we all came from a common ancestor, and no matter how different two things might look, deep down the very fact that they're alive means they're related. In this way, species can be seen more like a spectrum, where certain organisms fall closer to one another than others. Trees and plants would be on one side, animals on the other. Of course, in reality, it'd be much more complicated than what's on screen, but it's a better way to begin thinking of the evolution of species. Organisms closer to each other on the spectrum might be able to reproduce with one another. In many cases, this is because organisms closer together are more likely to have the same number of chromosomes, which makes reproduction between them easier, like coyotes and wolves, which both have 78 chromosomes. But organisms don't require the same number of chromosomes as their partner to reproduce, as a horse has 64 while a donkey has only 62, and can still produce mules, so we can't even use chromosome number to help define species. A good real-world example of this spectrum can be found along the west coast of the United States when looking at something called a ring species. Insatina salamanders live throughout this region, but when they encountered a physical barrier, the Central California Valley, the single population split into two. As each population continues further south, they evolve slightly several times, becoming what we'd call subspecies, another oddity of this whole species concept. Once the valley closes and the populations meet back up, they're too different to interbreed, despite a clear line of interbreeding through their relatives being possible. So where's the line? By current definitions, these two would clearly be considered a different species, but these and these and these and these would be considered the same. So if both species can be species with this population, how can they not be species with each other? It's just not a useful term in this regard. But this doesn't mean the concept of species isn't still incredibly useful when thinking about organisms and evolution. Humans love to categorize things, and that's why we want to call organisms that look different a species. And in most cases, and for most purposes, this makes sense to do. Blue whales and fruit flies are clearly different, and it's easier to think of them as their own species than two distantly related organisms. While the line might be fuzzy, I think deep down we all know there's some sort of separation between organisms, even closely related ones. I think it was Charles Darwin himself who said it best when he wrote, No one definition has as yet satisfied all naturalists, yet every naturalist knows vaguely what he means when he speaks of a species. Thanks for watching, please let me know what you think in the comments. I'm sure there will be some people who disagree with me and I'd love to hear some arguments. If you want to see more videos like this, make sure to give this video a like and subscribe. My Twitter is somewhere on this page as well if you're interested. I have another video coming soon, so stay tuned until then. Thanks.